As we've seen a reckoning of systemic racism and inequality in nearly every corner of society over the past year, executives from the public and private sectors are approaching their roles very differently. Leadership is evolving. Squawk Box co-anchor Andrew Ross Sorkin is back with us now in conversation with former Xerox chair and CEO Ursula Burns and the Ford Foundation president Darren Walker for this thought-provoking and important discussion. Andrew? Ursula, Darren, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a remarkable year, and you both have been at the center of an important conversation about race in America and in corporate America in particular. And I want to talk to you about that. And there's so many things to discuss about how leaders should think about all this. But before we do that, what, what I really want to do, uh, Ursula, is ask you about this, because I, I want to make this personal. Um, you've written a memoir. It's called Where You Are Is Not Who You Are. And for everybody out there, you should read the book, but you need to make sure you get to the very bitter end, because on the final page of the book, there are six lessons from your mother. And there's one that I want you to speak about, if you would, which is, she says, don't let the world happen to you. You happen to the world. And I think that that's happened this year more than ever, though throughout your life you've been doing it. But what do you think she meant by that? She meant that you can't be passive. You can't talk about them doing things or they should have, or if I were there, I would have. Her point of view was always to engage. You have to be engaged in the conversation. You have to lead sometimes um, the start of a journey. So her, her, she said it to myself, to my sister and my brother, we absolutely have to participate and be active in the world. And if we, if we don't, basically we get, <laughs> we get back what we put in. If you put in nothing, you probably get very little back. If you put in something, you'll get something back. And what would you think of this past year and your role in it? I think that more than any of the achievements, you know, how much money you made, how, how you went, how high you went in the corporation, anything, you know, what boards you sit on, all of that stuff. She was more proud. One of her other sayings was, your measure of goodness is how much you leave behind, not how much you take away. She would always say, leave behind more than you take away. And I think that... What I started to do throughout earlier in my career, but I think it's coming to a crescendo this year, is to become even more uh, obvious or outspoken about, on my behalf, but on other people's behalf as well, people who look like me, people who started like I did, and try to be a voice of um, reasonableness from a position of power, right? So people will listen to me now. I've kind of done a lot of stuff. So they listen to me. I'm on the Ford Foundation board. I'm on the Exxon Mobil board. So people say, oh, she has a, maybe she's worthwhile. Using that voice to, to say, let's get together. First of all, let's build something versus tear something down. Let's get together and let us try to be a better nation, a better individual, a better citizen, a better whatever, and participate. The only way to get there is if we help each other. There is no other way for us to actually solve the problems or address the opportunities we have without us working together. And I lived through four years, we all did, of really divisive language of this zero sum game of, you know, I have to get what's mine. And it, it really troubled me because I know that's not how I got to where I am, that's for sure. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a product of all of the charity you can possibly get anywhere and, the, and support that you can get anywhere. And I think that we have to be ready and willing to lift people up or else we're going to be in a fight to the death of the people who have very small number right. and the people who don't very large number. Darren, uh, you've also been on the front lines uh, of this issue, um, not just this year, but for a very, very long time. And you're on the boards of uh, so many different institutions. And I know there have been so many difficult, hard conversations that have happened over the year. And I'm curious if you could speak to what those conversations are like, because I think that there's a sense of where the country would like to be, where leaders would like to take the country, philosophically, perhaps. But how to get there is another issue. Thanks, Andrew. I think uh, I'm honored to be here with my friend Ursula. And I think, as I reflect on your question, there has never been a harder, more difficult time to be a leader 
in America, and certainly the leader of a public company. And I think the thing that I have experienced on the three boards uh, where I'm lucky enough to be a member is playing a role with all humility um, that helps to build trust, that creates the space for the directors, the CEO, to have candid, uh, authentic conversations where those CEOs and uh, directors who are primarily white can talk about their vulnerability, their, uh, their concerns, the things that bother them about some of the discourse and the language, and to basically use that trust because ultimately it is only when there is trust that you can have the kind of authentic conversation at the board table where I can say something I said, and I'll share it in a, in a board meeting, when I was making the case for why I shouldn't be the only black trust, the black director. I said, I'm a token here. Everyone said, oh, you're not a token, Darren. That's not, you play a vital role, et cetera. What I was saying was the board was comfortable with one of me because boards have understood that when you have one, that means diversity. Now, diversity is truly being understood to mean not just one, that actually one is token. And the ultimate objective of, of the work that I am doing and Ursula is doing is to move from tokenism to transformation. And the leaders who are doing that best are leading conversations based on trust. And they also have the qualities of grace and compassion and empathy. And those are the leaders, and I see many of them among the leaders I, I deal with, certainly the three boards that I sit on at Square and PepsiCo um, and Ralph Lauren. Do you think that these conversations are, are, are truly honest? And, and I ask, and I'm curious what both of you think, because I have heard anecdotally conversations, um, and it often breaks down uh, on race. I've heard, um, I've heard white people, um, members of boards say that they feel they can't say certain things in a board meeting. I've heard black people who are members of boards say that they don't think that they can say certain things and that it's actually gotten more complicated, not less. I think, that's because think? We're, I think that's because we're at the beginning of this journey of this, Darren described this journey of getting to trust, getting to candid conversations where vulnerabilities really come out on the table. I think the reason why people are uncomfortable, as they should be, is that we're all learning, right? We're all learning how to have a conversation that is not divisive, that's not divided, that it doesn't insult. So this is just, I think it's a phase that we're going through. The important thing is that we can't stop the conversations. We can't pretend that we know all of the answers. We have to like, kind of like power through things and learn, just like you do socially just like you do in your family. There's no difference. We're all humans in the room with different experiences and we have to actually work together to get to a good point and a good conversation. I will say that not everyone actually truly believes, but that's okay. I mean, the people who don't truly believe will probably never come along, but I am, I am convinced that we are at a point in a movement where there's significantly more belief and structure and comfort to have these conversations. And Andrew, can I just say, I, I agree with you. Let Please. me be really clear. I think there are many white uh, business leaders, uh, directors who do not feel they can say what they really believe without some uh, stigma, some sanction uh, to their voice. And my job, uh, as a director in the spaces and places I, I am present is to help facilitate the kinds of conversation so that we have a safe space. Everyone needs to have a safe space, including white people, for Absolutely. us to be able to actually so, make progress. So, but how, how should this work? And I ask uh, as genuinely as I can, uh, the CEO of Snowflake recently made some comments uh, about 
how he thinks about hiring um, and how he thinks about hiring related to diversity. And I think he came to his view honestly. Uh, and clearly, there it was a lot of folks who thought his view uh, was offensive. Um, and they took offense. And he immediately turned around and apologized for his view and said he didn't mean what he said. I mean, and this becomes a, this is the this is the issue of sort of how do you get to that place? I, I would I would just say that that we all have to believe, as Ursula said, we're on a journey, and we should not, uh, when a mistake is made, when a word is used out of context. We should not attribute to that individual an intent to harm, an intent to be racist. And, and what that requires of us, again, as I said, we all need more grace, humility, uh, more compassion for each other. Um, that doesn't mean that we uh, allow it to, to go without uh, being uh, discussed, being called out, uh, but we can't simply shut down and shut out people who are essential, who we need as allies on the journey, simply because they make a misstep out of benign misunderstanding, out of ignorance, out of their own implicit bias, especially if they're willing to acknowledge that. I will just add to that. People need, I, I, I agree with all of the patience that we have to have, but leaders have to be a little bit smarter than they, some of them than they have been. It would be great what if you mean? actually tested out, tested out or thought or had diversity around you before you actually launched into a conversation, particularly given the situation that we're in, where every word is parsed. I don't want you to become right. totally... Um, defensive, but some of the comments are actual, just you know, foot in your mouth comments, and you should be a little bit smarter, a little bit better prepared on that. So I do agree that we can't shoot everybody who makes a mistake. My goodness, you know, I'd be dead. But literally, we have to actually have the leaders also have some responsibility to understand there's some paths that you just don't go down, or before you go down, you should actually probably check with somebody who's been down that path before, before you use language that's inappropriate, before, they, before you, you um, use examples that are inappropriate, it's probably a good idea that you actually think about it a little bit. And if, it, if it's too far out on the edge, I would say shut up because the, the amount of time it's going to take right. for you to repair yourself is too much. I don't think we have to be overly cautious and kind of script every word, but some of the faux pas have been absolutely uh, poor preparation faux pas. Um, you both use the word patience and journey, uh, but there are a lot of folks who also um, think this needs to move a lot faster. And I, I, I'm curious how you think about the speed of the journey, if you will. Darren? I think the speed of the journey needs to be yesterday. But I also understand that we're talking about human behavior, uh, accreted uh, cultures, uh, that did not uh, pop up yesterday. So let us understand that we are going to be on a journey and we are going to move hopefully at an accelerated pace to make the change. But the change has to begin at the top. And when you start to make those changes at the board table, in the C-suite, on the operating committee, it's remarkable how quickly you see other things change. That we know from the data. And so I think if we want this to move faster, let's look at the boards. Let's look at who's in the C-suite. And when that kind of accounting actually happens and the change starts to happen there, I think we're going to see cascading out a lot of change a lot faster than we think. Okay, before we, before we end, I'm, I want to ask both of you uh, uh, the following question. Is there any great examples of either business leaders or companies or boards themselves uh, that you either may be on or that you've been watching from afar that you say, you know what, that's the model, folks. Look at what they're doing. That's working. Ursula? I would say, and this is not to kiss up, I'm one of the most effective and diverse boards in a very complicated organization that I'm on is on the Ford Foundation Board. We were just talking about this. This is a 
an amazing group of people who are unbelievably different, um, different backgrounds, different everything. So everything, different parts of the world um, in a very complicated space. You know, eradicating inequality is not like easy, <laughs> easy to measure, discuss, and it's it operates very well. It's extremely diverse, and and not only because Darren is on the show or because I am on the board. It's just a very complex organization that works very well, and the diversity actually makes it work better. I'm going to say another thing, another company, a public company that would surprise a lot of you, <laughs> and that's Uber. Interestingly enough. The journey that Uber has been on since I've been engaged in Uber is one that I am very proud of. You know, we have a CEO and a board that understands where the company started when it went public, how this a big a lift it had to have to get out of this place that it was in, and who is aggressive and risk taking in their movement. They are far from perfect. We are far from perfect, perfect at Uber. Dara is far from perfect in his leadership and governance. The board is as well. But this is a place where we talk about the issues, where we're willing to kind of, you know, you know, in some places hold your nose and take a dive in, and see how it works, and then come up. I'm really pleased with the approach of that company, even though it's not perfect. Darren, I won't. Oh, you can't use the say, Ford Foundation because it's already been used. I'm not using the Ford Foundation, most certainly not. I would say the three boards that I serve, um, PepsiCo, Ralph Lauren, and Square. The kinds of conversations we have at the board table, uh, I will, I can assure you that um, there isn't much inauthenticity or insincerity or people feeling like they can't say how they feel. And I do believe that part of my role has been to help encourage the environment so that everyone can say what they truly feel. And in each of those circumstances with Ramon LaGuardia at PepsiCo, with Jack Dorsey uh, at Square, um, and with Patrice Lovett at Ralph Lauren. We have a CEO who himself is prepared to engage and who genuinely seeks to understand, not lecture, not mm -hmm. bring an ideology. And that's when you really start to see change happening. And at each of those three companies, I can assure you, we're well on the way on the journey. Yeah. I, I, I know I promised that was our final, final question, but I wanna ask both of you uh, one more because it relates, to, it relates to exactly what you just said. And I'm, I'm very curious, when you think about the idea of diversity and you think about the skill sets and talents and how you measure for example, the CEOs that you put in place in some cases. How do you think about it? It's foundational. It's kind of like asking where does ethics stand? We don't, we don't have a lot of confusion about how important and foundational it is. I think diversity, equity, and then finally inclusion absolutely is one of the foundational elements. It's not a choice between you know, a, a bigger balance sheet or a smaller balance sheet, or you're not more ethical or less ethical. It's a foundational element in the company. And if you think about it that way, it's not something that you can think about trading off. And that's how I'm, I'm so pleased with Darren's three companies. I'm on the board of two public and three private. The leaders, what you select as a board member when you're in a situation that I'm in or in, that Darren is, is, are companies that actually understand that it's foundational. That this is not a discussion that is topical today and, and really not a hot item tomorrow. It's always there. Maybe not always at the front right. of the agenda, but it's always there. Darren, couldn't agree do you have a view on this? Have, 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 have I misarticulated the question? And not misarticulated the question, but is the way I even framed it, the, maybe, maybe the way I framed it is the problem. It is. I think no, it is part, part of the problem. problem. Sorry to jump in here. It is part of the problem because... You, you you frame it as if as if we could kind of like choose from the menu of things that we're going to do. We're going to do ethics today, and we're going to do diversity tomorrow. We don't think about it. we're going to do talent the next day. All these things are fundamental and foundational to success of a company. You know, you can actually have a little bit less money. You can't have a little bit less diversity, a little bit less eth ethics, and be a successful, future-ready, long-standing company, organization, government, etc. Darren. I agree with Ursula, and beyond that, I think 
to be successful. I mean, I think this is what's important. I, unfortunately, Andrew, diversity over the arc going back to the original affirmative action executive order through the Baki case, through the various litigations, has taken on the moniker of meaning you have to um, dilute quality, that you are doing something for the enterprise that will actually diminish its capacity. What we know from the research is that actually diversity makes a company stronger, more resilient, and ultimately more profitable. So we know that now from the evidence, but the hard part that we have to overcome is that it requires behavior change, and we're all human beings, and incumbency is among the most durable features Absolutely. of a legacy company. And so if you are a legacy and you want to remain relevant, successful, and profitable, diversity, as Ursula so rightly says, is not an option. It's an essential core competency. And any leader that you choose should understand that. Darren Walker, Ursula Burns, thank you for the conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Good to be with you. And thank you, Darren. Good to be with you. Thank you.